great to see the five and the seven together at last. We're kind of sort of, hi to all of you in the annex. I feel like this is a good warm up for Thanksgiving, where you know you pull out the card table. But I'm not sure if that means you're like the kid table or something. Is that offensive? Too late now, if so, I'm so sorry. But we're happy you're here. Sorry we don't have a better sound system and seat or a seat at all for you, but we're really happy you're here. Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter six. Um, if you don't have one, again, stick your hand up in the air or uh, feel free just to sit that out. Luke chapter 6. Um, just because I don't want to answer 300 questions, the bandage. <sighs> I would love to say that after our teaching series on nonviolence, that I was there and it was a moment and I had the courage to like not act with, and it wasn't. I was walking with Tammy and I literally walked straight into a screw sticking out of a parking sign. I literally got screwed, not in the crass, (laughs) literally, okay? Not in a crass way at all. We need one more uh, Bible down here, those of you that are on the Usher thing. So that's all the story. There's no story at all, but I will have a scar for life. But literally the first thing Tammy said to me was, you know, honey, Scars are really hot on guys. <laughs> okay, if you're Jason Statham, I'm not sure if that's true for me. But uh, we're really happy you're here. Again, wherever you're at with Jesus, really safe place. Um, please, so we're in Luke. We are nearing the end of our fall practice on discovering your identity and calling. Talk about the new Sam Smith record. Can we do that in church? All right, so do you have this? I hope you have this. I, I'm not really even to R&B, and I can't stop listening. It's so good. And I think, on a serious note, I think Sam... Um, grew up in the church, but he's gay. And so a major theme in his songwriting is wrestling with that tension between his theology and his sexuality. This song is off the new record. It's called Pray. And uh, this second verse in particular, put that lyric up, caught my ear the first time through. We're just going to leave it right there. We're just, we're, at some point you have to teach the Bible and talk about Jesus, but it's all on iTunes. Now, where, where Sam Smith is at with Jesus is none of my business. I hope the two of them work things out because I would love to have him come lead worship at some point. <laughs> but that lyric does a great job of capturing the zeitgeist, I think, of our generation, You know, on one hand, it's like we want God or some idea of God in our life. But then on the other hand, we kind of want to do our own thing. You won't find me in church. No. You know, (laughs) reading the Bible. Uh, But I am still here. And why are you clapping for that? Uh, I'm still your disciple. I'm not really a saint. I'm more of a sinner. You know, and and then that great line, I don't want to lose, but I fear for the winners. And I just think... That is a gross misreading of what a disciple of Jesus actually is. So we've said this before. The word disciple in Greek, that's the language that the New Testament was written in, is is mathetes. Can you say that? Mathetes. And um, it can be translated disciple. That's just fine. That's a bit of a churchy word that we don't use outside of the church. And um, a number of really smart people argue that a much better translation is apprentice. Because discipleship was a whole life apprenticeship under a rabbi. For example, take a look at Luke chapter 6. If your Bible is open, look down at verse 39. He, Jesus, also told them this parable. So here's a little mini teaching of Jesus. Can the blind lead the blind? What's the answer? No. That's the answer. (laughs) Will they not both fall into a pit? The student, now the word there in Greek is mathetes, so the student, the disciple, the apprentice, is not above the rabbi, 
But everyone who is fully trained will be or will become like their rabbi. Notice that for Jesus of Nazareth, the end goal of apprenticeship to him was to become like him. Now, the question that we're kind of on to at this point in our fall practice is how. So if you missed the last bit of time, which was more about the why, go back and listen. But now, really, we're on to the question how. Because it's a little bit easier said than done. Like, Jesus, you know, the bar is set a little high with him. So go be like Jesus. Great. Okay. How? And the answer is through spiritual formation. Now, again, go back and listen to the podcast if you missed the last week or two. This teaching in particular is part Two. So I know I left a lot of you like on the edge of your seat last week, and I'm kind of sorry for that, but you're back. So here we are. Here's a quick recap of part one, if you missed it. We define spiritual formation, and if you don't know that language, that's just fine. We defined it as, quote, the process by which we are formed to become like Jesus, and in doing so, more like our real true self. And we made the point that spiritual formation isn't a Christian thing, it's a human thing. Meaning we're all being formed every single minute of every single day. The question is not, are you being formed, but who or what are you being formed into? Put another way, it's not, um, are you a disciple? It's who or what are you a disciple of? So last week, we covered our first spiritual formation paradigm out of two, what we call unintentional spiritual formation. I know that is lousy language. I asked all of you who work in branding to email me nothing in my inbox, all right? So please, tomorrow morning, I would love to wake up to that. But we said that we're all formed, first off, by the stories that we believe, secondly, by our habits, third, by our relationships, and then fourth, by our environment. For us, it's Portland, and of course, we all live in two places at once, now with the iPhone. And all of this happens over time and through experiences. Now, when we say unintentional, what we mean by that is all you have to do is wake up in the morning. Right? You don't have to take notes, you don't need a New Year's resolution next month and like an accountability group or a mentor or a therapist. All you need to do is wake up and do whatever it is you do every morning through your week. Just live and be you and you be, are being formed. You're becoming somebody. The question is who or what are you becoming? So our apprenticeship to Jesus has to offset all of that. Does that make sense to you? We don't start with a blank slate. We start, and the wind is not at our back. It's actually in the exact opposite direction. There's a story that is told about Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right before World War II. uh, The Nazi empire is at its height, and the church in Germany is corrupt because of it. And so Bonhoeffer goes off into kind of the wilderness, out into the country, to start this kind of half seminary for 150 young theology students. He was a brilliant intellectual, but also kind of half communal living. And this is back in the 40s. And how many of you have read his book, Life Together? One of the best read, apparently not here, um, best read books on community, which comes out of this experiment. And he's out there. Now, Bonhoeffer comes from a family. He's a secular family, not a Christian family, but kind of high up in German society. And at one point, a family member, when I think it was his brother, went out to him and said, listen, this has got to stop. This is an embarrassment to the family name. You need to come back and take back your professorship. And you need to, like, get a wife, you know, put a ring on it or whatever. And, like, this is just too weird, this communal thing out here in the Jesus, whatever you're into with Jesus. And Bonhoeffer says, come with me. And they get in a rowboat, and they row across this lake that they were right next to. And on the other side of the lake is a Nazi training camp for Hitler Youth. And Bonhoeffer walks up to the top of this hill overlooking the training camp, and he says to his brother, this has got to be stronger than that. What we're doing here has got to be stronger than what they are doing there. And I would say the same thing is true for you and me. This has got to be stronger than that. Our apprenticeship to Jesus has got to be stronger than the stories we believe, our habits, our relationships, our environment right? Jesus and our spiritual formation has to be stronger than the city that we love and call home. So now we're ready for paradigm two or intentional spiritual formation. If we had like a giant theater screen, I would put the two right next to each other, but we don't. So hopefully it's there in your notepad or at least in your mind's eye. But each piece here is counter that last paradigm. So, and again, this is not scripture or this is none of that. This is just our summary of the teachings of the New Testament and all the best stuff in spiritual formation and psychology. So counter the stories we believe is teaching. So Jesus was a teacher. That's what that Hebrew word rabbi means, a teacher. And that's what he spent the bulk of his time doing, teaching. 
And that's like on purpose, not on accident. We are built to need teaching. And the best teaching out there does more than tell you fact from fiction or even right from wrong. It gets into your head with a vision of the good life. That's why so many of Jesus' teachings were actually stories. They were alternative stories. The question was once asked of Ivan Illich after decades of revolution in South America. A journalist asked him, what's the best way to change a society? Is it violent uprising or is it slow, gradual change? And his answer was neither. The best way to change a society is to tell an alternative story. And that you see Jesus doing that right and left. And teaching after teaching, an alternative story about what it means to be human, what it means to be spiritual, what it means to be sexual, what it means to be, it's an alternative story to the one on offer. And that kind of teaching, it gets into your head with a vision of the good life and it starts to undermine the lies that you and I believe with the truth and the reality of God. Now, thank you, Carol. Those of you that aren't a part of the seven, this is what you miss, right? (laughs) Now, by teaching, I mean a lot more than like the talk that I'm in the middle of right now. It is a teaching on Sunday. It's also a lecture or a Bible study. It's a podcast. More than anything, it's reading the Bible or reading books. It's also what, you know, scientists now call neuroplasticity, Hebb's Law, neurons that fire together, wire together, what the Hebrew prophets call meditation, what the writers in the New Testament call prayer. Paul, at one point, calls it the renewal of the mind. Like That might even be a better label for this category. I think of that classic line, if you know Romans, which is one of the most important writings in the New Testament, the fulcrum point in that letter, chapter 12 verse 1 after 11 chapters of theology it's like all right now time to land the plane what does he say do not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind there's our word transformed how by the renewal of your mind by getting but getting right ideas into your head is the starting point but it's not the ending point In fact, by itself, it's not enough um, for a lot of reasons. One is because you can't think your way to Christ-likeness because the way of Jesus is just that. It is a way of life. It is something that you do not only with your mind but also with your body, right? Really, that's what discipleship to Jesus is all about, getting what's in your mind down a few inches farther into your body, meaning into your whole life. But we still live in this post-enlightenment fugue. Our entire education system is still built around this. And there's lots of good writing being done about it, but the systemic change is yet to happen. So in this Western moment, we still have this kind of I think, therefore I am mindset, this Descartian, you know, he said human beings are res cogitans, or thinking things. Benjamin Franklin picked up on that and said we're a brain on legs, right? And in that theory of what it means to be human, you are essentially a computer, and all you need is like a software update. You just need more data in. And if that theory was right, then all you would need to do to have a healthy marriage is just read a book on how to have a healthy marriage. All you would need to do to lose weight is just like watch a YouTube video about a plant-based diet and how to exercise. And it would be that easy. Data in, transformation. How's that working for all of you? I'm guessing not so well. You don't need a PhD to figure out that knowing something in your head is not the same thing as doing something with your body, which is still not the same as wanting to do that something with your heart. And the reality is what we love in our heart, what we long for, and even the way that our body is set has far more of an effect on what we do with our body than what we know in our head. And so teaching, which is aimed at the head, it's aimed at your mind and your imagination, is vital But it is just the beginning. Your mind is like the portal to the whole person. Next, counter our habits, and this is key, is practice. Now, right now, in between our practices, we're teaching through the Sermon on the Mount, as most of you know, which if you're new to Jesus, that's a great place to start, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's Matthew's kind of collection of all of the most important teachings of Jesus in one place. And it's Jesus' manifesto for how to be human, for what he called life to the full. And what's fascinating about the Sermon on the Mount is if you know anything about church history and tradition is the way that it's been interpreted over the last two millennia of church history. Um, Ever since about the fourth century, there has been a running stream of people, even at an academic level, who have basically said it's a utopian ideal and it can't be done. Because if you read the Sermon on the Mount, like the bar is kind of set high, am I right? I think of the one line teaching, do not worry. I have that one down, but apparently some people 
have a struggle with that one, you know? A little minor issue in our society called anxiety. Or think of that line, he who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart, end quote. So the bar, yes, is set very high. But what a lot of people miss is that Jesus is also incredibly down to earth. Like, just read the Sermon on the Mount. It's about, Jesus just assumes that you get mad at people and people get mad at you. That you want to divorce your spouse. That you want to lust after and objectify a woman on the street or a man. That you want to judge other people. That you have anger and even contempt in your heart. And you look down your, at your nose at other people and think you are better than them. That you worry and you get stressed out about stupid things. And you buy more than you need. Like, does that sound at all familiar to you? Jesus just assumes basically that you're human. And at the same time, yes, the bar is set really high, but what so many people miss is, listen, that Jesus begins and he ends his sermon with this idea of practice. So we were here a few months ago in our teaching series, but this is a little line right before his first command, the first of many, you've heard it said, but I say to you, his reading of Torah. Jesus says this, therefore anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands that he's about to teach and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever, what, practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then the very last paragraph after the last command is a story about like two kind of home building projects. And he says this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, like the Sermon on the Mount, and puts them into what? practice, and he goes on and he says lots of really nice things about that person, and not so nice things about the person who hears these words of mine and, quote, does not put them into practice. So he begins and he ends this whole vision of a new way to be human with this idea of practice. He just assumes this will take practice. You don't read a command, do not worry, and you're like, great, I'll just not do that this week. No, you have to go out and practice that. Yet very few followers of Jesus, at least in our cultural moment, even think of apprenticeship to him as a kind of practice. Richard Foster, uh, most of you know that name, author of The Celebration of Discipline, a best-selling book in 1977. Actually, as far as I can tell, was written here. He was a professor at George Fox at the time. Any Fox students? And then, wow. Yeah, whoa. And you all sit together. That's kind of freaky, but we're really happy you're here, right? Um, so... After decades of teaching, and he was, you know, friends with Willard and all of that, after decades of teaching on spiritual formation all over America, he came to the conclusion in his own language that most people think we change by trying really hard rather than by training really hard, when the exact opposite is true. So I've used this analogy before, and I apologize, but just some of you are new and others of you need to hear it again, all right? But um, think about any kind of change. Let's say you want to make a change in your life, major or minor. Let's start with something major. Let's say, hypothetical scenario, this is not passive-aggressive, I promise. Hypothetical scenario, you're here tonight and you're out of shape. Let's say you're even overweight and you're an asthmatic. Let's just throw that in on top of it, all right? And for some reason tonight, you're inspired to run the Portland Marathon uh, this coming October or even sooner, the Shamrock or whatever in March. You're just like, I want to, I want a whole, my whole body, all of it matters to Jesus. Okay, and so you're off. How do you run a marathon? Or more importantly, how do you become the kind of person who can run a marathon? By trying or by training? By try it's not by training, by trying. Uh, what would happen if tomorrow morning you got up, you put on your running gear, and you went out and you tried really hard to run 26.2 miles. What would happen? Yeah, you'd feel a lot of pain, you'd make it to about mile four, and then you would die. <laughs> now, if Gerald or somebody was there to like ride his bicycle next to you and pray over you and prophesy over you and just Instagram story you along the way, then you'd make it to mile six and then you would die. But you would still die. And it would be easy to come to the conclusion, it can't be done. When that's not true, it can be done by pretty much any one of you in the room tonight. Um, unless if there's a disability or something, it can be done by pretty much, it just can't be done by you yet. So how do you run a marathon? Well, not by trying really hard, that's, that doesn't work. By training really hard. You go out tomorrow morning, you run, let's say a mile, and then you take a day off, and then you run two miles, or a mile and a half, and then you take another day off. And how many of you have done, uh, you've trained for a marathon or half marathon or something like that? You don't read, you don't exercise, what do you? <laughs> this morning it was like half the church. What is up? Well, which, you know, I'm, we're happy you're here. We're really happy. This is a safe place, you know. All, all that is true. So it's really, it's not rocket science. You just, 
add one mile on to your, quote, long run every single week. So that your first week, your long run's a mile. Your second week, it's two miles. The third week, it's three. Then you normally take a week off, and then you do three again, and then four, and then five, then a week off, then five, then six, then seven. And what happens, I just watched a guy in my community train for the Portland Marathon. He trained for a year is over a long period of time, six months go by, nine months go by, 10 months go by, all of a sudden, your long run, you're up to 16, 17, 18, 20, 23, 25 miles, and over a long period of time, through practice, through training, not through trying really hard, through training really hard, you become the kind of person for whom running 26.2 miles is hard, it will always be hard, but it is well within your capacity as a human being. Does that make sense? That's how we change. Yet very few of us approach our apprenticeship to Jesus this way. Most of us hear a teaching on Jesus, such of Jesus, such as do not worry. And we go out, we hear a sermon, we're inspired, and we just go out and we try really hard to not worry. How's that working for you so far? And most of us make it like maybe to the car, and then we get a text from our boss, and it's all over, and we're stressed out, right? And it's easy to throw your hands up and say, it can't be done, it's a utopian ideal, whatever. I'll just take communion a lot and watch Netflix, you know? <laughs> and it's not true. According to Jesus, and I, even I struggle to believe this at times, but according to Jesus, you, through discipleship to him, can become the kind of person who is free from anxiety. Not perfect, doesn't mean you never get stressed out, this is life after all, but according to Jesus, you can become what Friedman called a non-anxious presence, and man, does our world need more of that in this cultural moment. How? Through practice. Dallas Willard used to say that every local church should essentially be a school of life where people come from all around the city to learn the way of Jesus, to learn a whole new way to be human. I love that idea. That's what we're trying to do, training to do here at um, Bridgetown, in particular over the last year or two. I have this friend down in San Francisco when I was doing a bunch of reading and research around spiritual formation that I went down to visit with, and he was doing this thing called the Jesus Dojo. Exactly. And, and, it, and a brilliant guy. Basically, for eight weeks, he would take 20 or 30 people through a practice in the life of teaching or, life or teachings of Jesus, and it was great stuff. And at one point, I said, you know, kind of gentle-like, like, so what's up with the Jesus Dojo name? It's a little odd. Um, so what, what's up with the Jesus Dojo? And he said, you know... Um, following Jesus or learning to follow Jesus is closer to learning karate than it is learning math or science. Yet our churches are set up more like university lecture halls. Think of this, a stage, a podium, a microphone, you sitting there facing me, taking notes, as you should. Um, <laughs> all of that. Then like a karate dojo. And there's, on, and there's nothing wrong with a lecture. We believe in that. But that's the mind. That's teaching. But there's only so far you can, if you want to learn karate, like a podcast and a YouTube series and an instruction manual will only get you so far. At some point, you need a master, you need a dojo, you need to wax on and wax off. <laughs> and if you want to learn to live the way of Jesus, a sermon series, a Bible passage, a church service, will, it is the beginning point. It's not a bad thing, but it will only get you so far. At some point, you have to wax on, and wa you have to pray. You have to live in community. You have to do justice. You have to live simply. You have to get healing from the inside out. You have to follow Jesus. So we have to move at some point from theory to practice. Now, of course, this idea of practice is a bit vague, so to be more specific, what we mean by practice is really the practices of Jesus or what in church tradition have come to be called the spiritual disciplines, which are practically speaking how we train to become more like Jesus. So let's go back to the peace example. How many of you want to become a non-anxious presence in our city? How many of you would love to be, if you're racked by anxiety, you would love to be set free by that, right? So one option is you just try really hard in the week ahead with Thanksgiving and traffic and all of that to just not worry. Have fun with that. Another option is that you train. How? Well, what if you were to take the template that was set down by Jesus' life and his teachings, and you were to, quote, follow Jesus. You were to follow, um, to pour your life into that template, and to do your best with your messy and your imperfect, and you're like, we're all in process, but you were to live like Jesus. What if, for example, you were to practice the Sabbath? Just take 24 hours, and, you know, or... Take 12, start wherever you're at, and turn off your freaking phone, and, and just don't buy anything or sell anything, or you don't even need to go anywhere. Just 
rest and worship and enjoy a day in Jesus' company. Do what's life-giving for you. If that's brunch with your friends, if that's a hike in Forest Park, that's a novel and then a nap and then another novel, that's just my style. Whatever your thing (laughs) is, like, you do you, but do it with, what if you just were to set aside a whole day to let your soul catch back up to your body and just to enjoy Jesus' company? What if you were in the morning, were just to, as Jesus did on a regular basis, Practice a little silence and solitude. I read this week that 89% of Americans check their phone before they get out of bed in the morning. What if, like, you know, Tammy and I just did this rock and roll thing a few months ago. We went back and we bought alarm clocks. Not an app on our phone. We actually bought, do you remember these? Some of you are too young to remember these. (laughs) It was like a long time ago, back in the 90s. And we started to put our phones away in the kitchen after dinner. And we had, like, every night, it's like you hear the, like you set this alarm clock. It's cool. It's like from MoMA. It's like modern design and stuff. But it's it's not very good quality. But anyway, um, what if you were to just wake up and just breathe for a little bit? What if you were just to take a moment over a cup of coffee or in your living room and just enjoy Jesus' company. Center your mind and your body in the reality of God and live out of what Jesus called abiding, out of that place of just restful, grateful relationship with Jesus all day long. What if you were to live in community and just, just, that's all, just share a meal with the same group of people on Thursday night or whatever? And the stuff that you're stressed about and that you worry and that you carry with you, what if you were to actually have a family to spread that out in, to pray for you and comfort you and encourage you and get your head back on track. You see what I'm saying? What if you were to just take on this virtue discipline of simplicity and just own less and buy less and sell less and just live well, but simply with what really matters at the forefront of your life? This is, this, these are the practices of Jesus. Um, my guess is that what would happen, not in a week, not even in a month, or even a, but over a long period of time, Through training, you would become a person of peace. So there's trying and there's training. Both are hard. One is impossible. I'll take hard over impossible seven days of the week. And this is the invitation of Jesus, to practice his way. And not alone, to do it in community, to adopt the practices of Jesus to make up your day-to-day life. Now, moving on. So, practice is counter our habits. Third, Counter our relationships is community. And what exactly is the difference there? Well, it's a bit arbitrary, but relationships we self-select based on preference. That's not all bad. You know, we meet somebody who, oh, you dress like me, or you're my age, or socioeconomic, whatever. I like you, or whatever. Like attracts like. Community is a bit different, though. By community, I mean the full range of relationships that are built around the way of Jesus. So this is your Bridgetown community. It's a best friend. It's if you have a roommate who's also a follower of Jesus or a spouse um, or a therapist or a mentor or a spiritual director or a pastor. And community is like an incubator for our spiritual formation. It is the context where we grow and we mature and we succeed and we fail and we doubt and we believe and we wrestle and we move forward and we move backward all in that safe place of community. And community does two very important things that are pretty hard to get anywhere else, exposure and encouragement. Exposure meaning it will expose where you are actually at in your growth and your maturity, for better or for worse. Put another way, community will bring out the best in you and it will bring out the worst in you. That's why community is so amazing and at the same time so hard and so difficult because it will also do that to the people in your community, bring out the best and bring out the worst. We are, I think 68% of our church right now is single and so love is in the air and and don't be creepy, but whatever. Um, And so on a regular basis, I see this pattern, a young couple at church, fall in love, whatever, and go through the wedding day, and then normally come to me about six months, maybe at tops a year in, and just kind of like bloodshot eyes, like, I just, what am I doing wrong? It's like, I'm so selfish. I wasn't selfish before. I guess you were, but, um, and I'm so like disorganized, and I'm bad with money, and I, I, I'm in debt, actually, and this, that, and it's like people are shot. I just have to sit down and say, okay, listen, it's not that when you got married, you became worse, It's that before you got married, you had no idea how bad you were, right? (laughs) And it takes that close of a relationship to expose where you're actually at. And listen, this is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. It's easy to lose sight of that in a marriage, in a community, in a friendship, 
when there's tension, when there's discord, our cultural kind of inclination is just to bolt and move on to where it's easy. Like that's where Jesus does some of his best stuff, where you're frustrated and people are frustrated with you. Like that's where he will expose where you're actually at. And then he's so gentle and he's so patient and he's so kind, usher you into healing. But exposure is just the first step. The second step, in a healthy community, in a Jesus kind of community, there's also encouragement. So your stuff is exposed or somebody else's stuff is exposed. But then there's encouragement where people say, listen, I see who you are, but even more so I see who you are, who you are becoming in Christ. And I want to partner with you to go onto that journey into fullness. Like that is what healthy community does. And honestly, living this way is hard. I know for a lot of you, especially if you're introverted like me or you have little children or you work a demanding job or you travel or whatever. But the reality is it's worth it every scrap of the effort. And you need this. Like Jesus did not have an apprentice. He had apprentices. You can't follow Jesus alone. I know that is so against the grain of our society, but you just can't. This is about us together practicing the way of Jesus. That is the context where you and I are transformed. Next, counter our environment is the Holy Spirit. Notice that teaching and practice and community all orbit around the Holy Spirit. He is the center of gravity. He is the source of power for our transformation. He is involved in teaching, even right now at work, in practice when you're there on the Sabbath or with your Bible or in prayer or whatever, in community, around a table. He is at the center of all that we do. And the key thing that you need to get about spiritual formation is that is it a joint partnership between you and God? God has a part, and you have a part. God has a role to play, and you have a role to play. And it's a both, and our responsibility is teaching. Just sit like, check, you're doing that right now, but one way of doing it. Practice, to practice the way of Jesus, and to live in community. That's about it. After that, it's on God. And of course, people, you know, as a, as a general rule, err on one of two sides. Either people think, you know, they have to do it all, and so they practice the spiritual disciplines until they're blue in the face and, like, grinding down to the bone. But far more of a problem, at least in a city like ours or even in a church like ours, is people just kind of want to sit back, relax, and expect God to do it all. And that's just not God's M.O. What's that famous saying? It actually dates back to the 4th century from Augustine. Um, without him, we can't, but without us, he won't. I think that does a better job of getting at the heart of God. This is a joint partnership. It's not about earning, but it is about effort. Willard used to say that grace is not opposed to earning. Um, I'm sorry, grace is not opposed to effort, but to earning. And the two are not the same thing. My point is that you have a part, and so does God. But that said, here's the good news. Um, Jesus does all of the heavy lifting. It is a joint partnership, but it's not 50-50. I'm not a mathematician. I don't know what the breakdown is. Like, I don't know who owns what, but I know it's not 50-50. I don't know if it's 80-20 or 90-10 or 99.9.01. I have no clue, but I know that Jesus does all of the heavy lifting, that as you take on your responsibility, as you, uh, the renewal of the mind, you think God's thoughts after him, as you practice the spiritual disciplines, as you live in community, you do your part, And in each moment, all you do is you open up your mind and your body, your whole person, to the power and the presence of the Spirit of God. And it's just time after time after time, God, I'm here, and you're here too. Have your way, like work your transformation in me and through me. Now, of course, this sounds great, but same deal as the last paradigm. All of this happens over time. And can can we just talk about this for a minute? So... I'm like you. I grew up in a culture where I'm used to, like, everything at my fingertips, right? FedEx, the microwave, text message, all of that. We live in this instant gratification culture, but the reality is that the best things in life and the best things in the kingdom of God still take a very long time. There is no, thank you, Kara, there is no shortcut to spiritual formation. There's no, like, killer app out of Silicon Valley. Like, there's this new startup on, like, GoFundMe. It does not exist. Um, If you are here and you're feeling a bit down and out or just a bit bummed about how long it is taking you to change, there's an area in your life where you just want to grow up and you want to mature and you want to become more like Jesus and you know that's not who you really are and you just feel like, man, how this is taking forever. Welcome to the club. We call it the church. Welcome. (laughs) 
and you are in good company. I'm with you, and so are the people to your right and to your left. In fact, actually, you will feel this more as you grow and mature in Jesus. Because early in your apprenticeship to Jesus, the kind of stuff that you and Jesus are working on is more surface level. The farther down the path you get, the more like you and Jesus are working on stuff that is deep in your person from your family of origin, your personality, like your cult. It's like deep in you and it's lodged in there and there is healing and there is freedom and there is growth and there is transformation, but that stuff is deep and it does not go away fast or easy. And it just, it's slow and it's time consuming. So time here is a bit of a double entendre. We mean that it takes a long time, like our growth and our maturity is measured not in days or in weeks, but in years or really in decades. But at the same time, it also takes a lot of time. Like any relationship or like anything in life, you get out of it what you put in. That's why some people follow Jesus for two or three years and grow and mature more than people who have been around church for two or three decades. Right? Because it's all at some point about how much time you put into it. And with Jesus, time always pays back with dividends. But just think about how much time we waste, right? So the average, this is like a stat from every Gallup poll, the average American watches five hours of TV a day. I just do the math on that. Five hours. The average, I just read a study from um, Neeson a few days ago, the average child aged 2 to 11 watches 24 hours of TV per week. My children only watch 21, and we're not even close, right? <laughs> we're nowhere close to that. Actually, and actually, TV, um, watching TV goes up the older you get, not down. The average millennial is, you're like, I'm not on TV, I don't even own it. The average millennial is on his or her iPhone five hours a day. If you have an iPhone, on average, you swipe it 2,600, I think, don't quote me, 17 times a day. I love that last week in our practice, if you were there with your community, my community is actually a week behind, so we've yet to do it. But Josh uh, Porter wrote up last week's practice, and I love that he had us, were you there, scroll down on your phone to check your battery and like how much time went to each app. Did anybody do that? You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand. I, but thank you for the hand. <laughs> I was so happy I went to do it. And uh, my phone is like ancient. It's like a, like a 7S or something. It's so old. And um, it's all glitchy. And I literally could not get it to work. I was like, thank you, Jesus, for your mercy, because I don't want to know how much time I spent on text message app or Instagram or whatever it is. But just, I mean, seriously, think about what else you could do with your time. 20 minutes of Candy Crush, you could, which apparently is a thing. Um, I never played it because I'm better than all of you. But uh, <laughs> like in 20 minutes, you could read through the Sermon on the Mount. In one season of, not Stranger Things because it's great. What's another show that's popular but not, <laughs> but I don't want to pick on Stranger Things. What's something else? Friends? Friends? That's just time warp right there. <laughs> I don't want to cause a church split or anything though. That's a bit of a sacred cow. But in one season of whatever, like... You could share a month's worth of evenings with your community sitting around a table to know and to be known, right? In 20 minutes every morning, you know, dinking around on Instagram or reading the news or whatever, you could read through the Bible in a year and pray every single day. Like, just think about it. When people come to me and say, I'm too busy to live in community, practice spiritual disciplines, come to church every week, whatever the thing is. I used, I don't know, I'm like getting a little bit older. I used to just kind of smile and nod. And now I smile and I nod. And then as nice as I can, I say, no, you're not. You're not, you're not too busy. Like, and then I just say, how many hours a week do you watch TV, play on social media, and go shopping? Usually people are really quiet and don't come back to our church after that. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm so confused, right? Or sometimes people will say, no, I work this crazy demanding job and I'm up early and I work and I don't even have social media or whatever. And then, and then I usually just, as nice as I can, I say, listen, if you honestly don't have time on a Sunday to just come for two hours and worship Jesus or to live in community, you, you honestly don't have time to share a meal once a week. No, I don't. I'm too busy. Okay, so you eat dinner, right? Yes. Okay, so there's, there's an hour. So Really, it's just like an hour and a half or so after dinner where you sit in a living room. It's in your neighborhood, ideally, like you live close to it. Um, you don't have time to just one night after dinner sit on a couch and 
talk about the practices of Jesus and pray for each other? If the answer is honestly, no, I don't have time for that, then you are too busy to follow Jesus. And you have to radically reorient your life around the way of Jesus. This is one of the hard lessons that our church is kind of sort of learning right now is that to follow Jesus, you can't just add Jesus in on top of an already over busy life. Like, to follow Jesus is a lifestyle. It's, it's the whole thing. And if you're not there yet, this is such a safe place. Wherever you're at, if you don't even believe in Jesus yet, totally safe place. But at some point, when you go through the waters of baptism and you come out the other side, the invitation of Jesus is not just to get like a little free therapy on Sunday, which this is not, so whatever, um, and spiritual like shot in the arm, like to make you feel good, or like the invitation of Jesus is come, take up your cross and follow me, end quote. It's a whole life. And if you want to experience the life of Jesus, and trust me, I am so imperfect and messy and in process, and it's not, but it is the best thing ever. And if you want to experience what Jesus called life to the full, then you have to follow him with your whole life. Like that, that's why Jesus said, take up your cross. There's a cost to it. Bonhoeffer, to quote him again, said, we talk about the cost of discipleship. That was his best-selling book. But we also need to talk about the cost of non-discipleship. Meaning, yes, it costs you. It costs you time, all that stuff to follow Jesus. But it costs you even more not to follow Jesus. Yes, it costs you to practice Sabbath. It costs you even more not to. Yes, it costs you to be here at church on a Sunday night when you could be watching Stranger Things. Such a sacrifice. But it costs you even more not to. I digress. I'm getting preachy. It's kind of what I do, right? I'm one of the few vocations in the world where people can say, that's kind of preachy, and I'll be like, thank you. <laughs> All that to say, it takes a long time, and it takes a lot of time. And finally, this happens through the hard knocks of life. Whether you're an apprentice of Jesus or not, life is not easy. But it's the times of life that we dread, that we avoid, that we work overtime to escape into our phone from or whatever, that have the most potential to catalyze our growth and our maturity. We live in a nation that is built around life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet sociologists argue that with each passing year, our happiness level goes down and not up. It's in the wrong direction. More money, more stuff, more freedom, more this, more equality, all of that. And it's in the wrong direction. And that's because happiness is not the point of life. It is the byproduct of a life well lived. If you trace the etymology of that word, happy, back to its origin, it's in Greek philosophy. It's the first time that the word was used. And it was a synonym originally for virtue. For a a happy person was a good person. And a good person was a happy person. If you want to live a happy life, then follow Jesus. Become more like him. Become your real true self. And let happiness be the byproduct, even in the unhappy times of life. Some of you are here tonight, and you're in an unhappy time in life. And it's hard, and you just want to get through it, or past it, or escape it, or numb the pain. But if you will just open yourself up to Jesus in that moment and just stay there. You don't have to do it. Just stay there. Just stay with Jesus through it. Just anchor yourself through that storm. Just wait through it with Jesus. It has the potential to transform you to become more like Jesus and your real true self. Now, to recap, how do we change to become more like Jesus? Through teaching, through practice, through community, more than anything by the Holy Spirit. And this, of course, happens over time and through the hard knocks of life. So our practice for the coming week, because we believe that the way of Jesus is just that, it is a way of life, is uh, on practicingtheway.org slash identity and calling. If you're a week or two behind due to Thanksgiving and the holiday, don't worry about it. My community is you have all the way until January to work this out. Last week was the habit audit. Hopefully that was helpful helpful or still on the docket for you. And now that you've identified some habits that are doing, God bless you, that are doing something to your heart um, to point it in the wrong direction, now the idea is a habit swap, to just take that habit and to swap it out from a habit from the life or teachings of Jesus or a practice or a spiritual discipline. Those of you that have been following Jesus for a while and kind of want the like level two thing, um, I would encourage you to pick more than one, pick at least two, and pick um, a downstream discipline and an upstream discipline. Meaning, by downstream discipline, I mean pick a spiritual discipline that's life-giving for you. It's fun, it's easy, you just love to go hiking in Forest Park and pray. Or you just love to like protest 
bless something in the name of Jesus. Um, or type eight on the Enneagram. Or you just uh, love to Sabbath, or you love to read, or whatever. Just something that's life giving for you. It'll be different for every one of you. And by upstream discipline, I mean something that is hard and difficult. Why? Because it's hitting you where you're weak. And we need both. We need downstream so that we actually enjoy following Jesus. And we need upstream so that we don't end up all lopsided in our personhood. And so the areas of our life where we're weak, like the, the upstream disciplines have the potential for Jesus to shore up your character in that area. So pick one or two, change your lifestyle, and out of that, your life. Now, to end, you're all picking up that transformation is possible. You can change from the inside out. You can become more like Jesus. You don't have to stay stuck. We all get stuck. Some of you are in the room tonight and you're stuck in bitterness. You're stuck in a wound from when you were seven years old. You're stuck in a divorce. You're stuck in a question. And that's okay, we all get stuck. But you don't have to stay stuck. You can break free. You can get whole. You can grow. You can mature. You can become like Jesus. Transformation is possible, but it's not natural. My wife will say that to me all the time. Remember, John Mark, Christ-likeness is not natural. I think she stole that from me a long time ago, but now it's her line, right? You say it to me all the time, Christ-likeness is not natural. It's not like you just come to church every other Sunday, read your Bible once in a while, listen to the Bible Project podcast once a month, and then like 10 years in, you're like, wow, I'm kind of like Mother Teresa the second. It just doesn't work that way. It just, that sounds, if it sounds too good to be true, yep, exactly. Like, it's not natural, but it is possible if you follow Jesus. And please listen to me. We're across the room tonight. Those of you that are young, the time to start is now. Don't delay it. We live in a Peter Pan city. Like, don't put it off. The sooner that you deal with your shadow side, that you grow, that you mature, that you adopt the practices of Jesus, the easier it will be. Your quirk, the quirks of your 20s or your college years, your high, become aspects of your character in your 30s. Get cemented into your personhood by your 40s. And you can change them, but man, you need a jackhammer at that point. The sooner you get started on your formation, the better. And for those of you that are older, and you interpret that to mean what you think it means, all right? Those of you that are older, please do not settle for the status quo, for what Willard called the gospel of sin management, where you just kind of get it to where it's like, it's kind of under control, and then you settle. You can change. I don't care if you're 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or north of that. Like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That is a lie from hell. It is not true scripturally. It is not true scientifically. Like, it's all, it's not true. You, no matter whether you're 15 or 83, you can change. You can grow. You can mature. But you have to follow Jesus. And that is the open invite of Jesus to every single one of you in the room, wherever you come from, whatever you've done, wherever you're at, whatever you think or don't think or believe or not even sure what you believe, the open invite of Jesus is to come, to take up your cross, and to follow him. Let's stand and pray together.